And he thought the best way to be at the front of the queue is just to move the queue. And that's what he's done. And so he's, he's come out the very first. And here we are. But so thank you guys for coming a little bit early. And Richard Curtis needs very little introduction. You know him by his, uh, not only his movie fame, but most importantly, and the bit that really gets me, is his amazing ability to see and come up with new ideas that have a real massive impact on the world. And one of the things that really got me excited, we were at an event at an insurance company in London, and he started talking about how you can use your money, just, just simple things about how you're doing things that you're already doing, but just repurposing. And he's done a lot of that in his career, and we're going to allow him to introduce, and we'll have a little uh, video both at the beginning and at the end about some of the things he's doing. But if you haven't, Google him and afterwards look at some of the things that no, he's done. Be crossed. They'll be crossed. Not at all. So what was movies. what was that? In, well, not not just the movies. What was that amazing video that you did for the SDGs? What's oh, it? Yes, that, what that was it one. called? It was called No Point Going Halfway. I think. Is it? Yeah. Some fantastic things. You need to Google this afterwards. So with no further ado, Richard Curtis. There we go. Well, I hope that, um, here we go, I, I, this is an all right level, is it, for microphones. So um, I'm enjoying getting to know Morris, who seems to be absolutely everywhere. I, uh, I spent an evening with Scott yesterday with some slightly dodgy hummus. Um, you'll be very used to that by the time you leave. Um, and uh, it's great to be here because of sort of the place and the time and some of my current obsessions. So I'm just going to whip through th some things that are of interest to me and a couple of observations and then uh, talk about this one particular thing, which I think might be helpful. Uh, and then with any luck, we'll have, you know, 10 or 15 minutes where we could just chat between ourselves because... Um, you know, very quickly, I was a filmmaker. I used to make uh, comedy TV shows. I then went to Ethiopia, where there was a famine in 1986. I started a fundraising charity called Red Nose Day, or Comic Relief in the UK. And that has so far raised, I think, £1.6 billion. Um, uh, pounds. And I, I suppose, therefore, I keep thinking, because I was in such an unpowerful situation when I did that, I'd written a couple of sitcoms, that I'm always really obsessed by the power of other people, uh, many of whom have, as it were, more money and more influence than I seem to have, and how they can change the world. And my attention's particularly, as it were, moved on to business recently. And I, I've sort of done a journey where having done fundraising, I then in 2005 uh, did a campaign in the UK and it was seen outside the world in the Live 8 concerts. I don't know if you remember that, which were organized by Bob Geldof and uh, Bono. And we did a lot of the material for that, you know, by the importance of lobbying politicians and, you know, billions of extra dollars in aid were gained through that. And we didn't ask the public for money. And one of the interesting things about that was we got absolutely nowhere with business. I mean, there were, there were a, a trio of bizarre meetings with men in suits and ties um, who just mistook us for dangerous, you know, left-wing activists. And all of that was about the Millennium Development Goals, which were UN goals particularly pointing sort of in the direction as were north-south transfer of wealth. Um, and so I got very obsessed by the sustainable development goals when they were going to be announced because I thought the MDGs hadn't been famous enough, hadn't been well enough known um, and had done amazing things. I mean, Bill Gates would say that the 25 years from 1990 to 2015 were the 25 greatest years in the history of human civilization in terms of unnecessary deaths, uh, the battle against extreme poverty, massive leap forward in healthcare and everything like that. But I got very obsessed by these goals and, you know, we worked on the branding and when you see this little film we're about to show, all the sort of shapes and boxes and short names are developed by us. And um, therefore we launched them with gusto and the big surprise of the goals has been how much traction they've actually had. And certainly some countries... Um, have really embedded them in the way that their governments, you know, run and work. But the big surprise has been business. In fact, the Secretary General the other day when we were meeting with him said, um, 
it's now a question, weirdly, of businesses pushing governments to do more and asking for legal changes and alterations in frameworks and all sorts of things so they can do more for the environment and more for gender equality and all of these things than the other way around, than what used to be, which was government coming down on hardness, hard on business and saying that you should be, as it were, better boys and girls. Um, and so, you know, when I talk to Morrison, he explains that he's got 28,000 uh, of you all the way around the world with some astonishing amount of money, which if you add up all the money that you all make. I think, well, this is where the real power is. And if you tie in sort of an increased political awareness with definitely a very activist younger generation, there are good things and bad things about the net, but certainly the way that activism spreads and that people can feel passion and demonstrate passion, that's amazing. And then as it were, the third thing is business at all level of all sizes. And so that's what I'd love us to meditate a little bit about, is how, as it were, individual businesses and a cluster of people who unite like you guys do, um, can make a big difference. So this first film is just really just branding. Um, so, But it is also saying that we've decided to make 2020 um, the big year. So that's exactly the same point as where we did the Live 8 concerts, which were 2005, five years in, 10 years to go, not doing well enough, amazing progress. But So I would say to all of you that when you leave here, I'm sure you'll have a million messages, but I'd love one of them to be 2020. I should really focus on this. Think about the sustainability of my business and the ethical nature of my business, the purpose-driven nature of my business. So um, here's a noisy film with a track by a hip band, I hope, or it's Bark. Oh no, wrong one. There's no, this is a very not, this is a very not hit band. <laughs> this is the noisy first one. Okay, but I think I saw the other one just going through when I was even walking up. See, nothing in life is perfect, not even the Sustainable Development Goals. <laughs> Okay, well, look, until you find that, let me... I'll go on chatting. <laughs> so, um, I mean... <coughs> okay, here we go. so many things in there that I would like to talk more about but you know one of the key things about these goals is the way they do unite the three areas of as it were development justice and planet all of which will apply to some extent to the business that you do and also the fact that they are both as it were local and global one of the worries about the old MDGs <coughs> is that you thought oh well that's for over there 
But I remember President Obama, when he launched them, the first thing he said is, I've got to make them work in America. We've got to make them work in the UK. They're for everywhere. They, there is much to do with domestic violence in the town where you live um, and planting trees there as they are to do with melting ice caps and you know, the spread of HIV. Um, so, I mean, my, I would just, on the subject of purpose-driven business, and I don't know how many of you will and do consider that and be really interesting how much it's on your radar but I find that in life generally those people who say well wait a minute I can do both and I can actually be as successful as possible and help as many people as possible that is one of the perfect mixtures and I've been lucky to do that in my career of being able to take whatever influence I have in the media and through the people I know and actually turn that to good while not having to sacrifice those of my money in films that do make money. Um, but it's quite an interesting moment when you talk theoretically to people now about business, the idea that there used to be a feeling that, as it were, you either chose to make a bit less money and do things a bit better, and that maybe that's not true. So I had a sort of defining conversation with Mark Carney, who's governor of the Bank of England, and he said, when I'm talking to people about ethical business, I say it is the most risk-free option that there is now. He says, basically, if you're thinking about basing your business on the SDGs, you're doing three things. One of them is you're thinking the long term. And he said, I've never known a business to thrive that doesn't have a leader who's looking forward five years, 10 years. You know, there are these amazing statistics that if temperatures do reach 4%, insurance will cease to exist as a business, as, as Australian insurers will be finding out today. You know, so you have to look into the future. He said, so I would always invest in someone who's thinking about the sustainable development goals because they're thinking long term. Secondly, he said, both for staff and employees and for consumers, this is becoming an increasingly important issue. People actually do want to believe in the purpose and the firm. Of course, there are people who work for Philip Morris, and I think they probably get paid more than other people. But I do think that there is a real feeling now. Unilever did an interesting thing where they did two adverts for the same job, and in one, they stressed, as it were, Unilever's extraordinary record in terms of sustainability and the other one they stressed holidays and perks and they got 70 percent more applications for the job that said that actually we're <coughs> a sustainable and interesting company than they did for the other one and of course you're seeing enormous movement in terms of consumers and again you know I don't know what kinds of businesses you're in whether you're in b2b or whether you're in consumer businesses but there's no doubt that the direction of travel in terms of what people buy is to buy things that they believe in even if it's words not a plastic bottle uh, you know, the things that they specifically won't go for. But enormous number of current success stories are to do with that kind of thing. And then the third thing that Mark Carney said is the bad guys are getting caught. He said, actually, the big business story now is not this person's quarterly returns have gone down a bit. Isn't that shocking? It's these people were Volkswagen were caught cheating in their tests about how much they were polluting. Um, you know, Facebook has been found out to be not placing itself properly. There are issues. All of these things are becoming important. So he says risk is long term is better for sustainability. Risk is better if you actually watch the way that you behave and both staff and consumers are better. So I'm very convinced by the argument that it's worthwhile, you know, all of you and all businesses saying, well, this is something where we actually think we might become more popular, we might actually be doing the right thing in our lives, and it shouldn't cost anything. When you talk to people from BlackRock, you know, they've just said this thing about their investment. They say the why not moment has arrived. That as far as they're concerned, when they're investing in businesses, why would you not go for a business that's paying attention to sustainability? Because actually, you're likely to get the most profit. And certainly, when I talk to investors, they say, seeing as how most businesses fail, and thank God I'm talking to people, none of whose businesses have failed, but they said, if you wanted to invest a business where the success will be spectacular, then some of the most purpose-driven businesses are the ones which deserve, as it were, the biggest gamble, because when they succeed, they really succeed. So, um, you know, my call to the rumors, as it were, do think about these issues, and I think they probably make business sense. Uh, and then you will all know much more than me 
as it were, how you do that, because you understand the texture of your work. And I've just got this one particular thing that I would like to raise, and I'm trying to um, convince Scott and Morris to, to mail out a lot about. But, you know, I was just thinking here in terms of sort of the things that you would deal with, obviously supply chains and, you know, working standards of all the people who you work with are very important. And certainly if ever we sell anything in my charity, we had a problem with a t-shirt once completely destroyed the sales of the t-shirt, you know. So obviously supply chains are an interesting area. You've got a choice of what your energy supplier is, whether or not that's renewable or otherwise. You've got a choice in terms of gender equality and representation on boards and all of those things which people are asking for more and more. You can not use plastic and not produce plastic. You can certainly look into your local communities and say, well, what are the needs in our community? What are the needs of the people who are working for us? And can we as a company with our influence and our money and the number of people that we've got actually dive in and do something there. So, I mean, those are some of the things that I hope that you would be thinking about in the normal course of business practice, because I'm hoping that, as it were, business and the goals and sustainability are a sort of continuous win-win now in the next 10 years. And by the way, the goals can never be achieved, obviously, without business being part of it. 70% of the jobs in the world come from business and employment is going to be one of the huge issues um, over the next 10 years, which leads into migration which leads into civil unrest all of these it will be business that is absolutely at the core it will not be celebrities it will not be aid agencies uh it, it will probably be even less government it will be business so as it were i call upon you to take on the mantle mantle of historic responsibility um as it were um, the other specific thing which I just wanted to show you this little film about, which I don't know as it were whether you have thought about, and if you have, forgive me, is an issue of pensions. So I've suddenly got really interested in some conversations about this. There's $3.2 trillion in UK pension funds, and most people don't know that their pensions are invested. So most people just think pensions are a magical thing you put into a bank and then you get more later. And yet, I think there's a Finnish study which says that if you invest in an ethical or sustainable pension, that is 27 times more effective than anything else that you can do in your private life in terms of electric cars and vegan eating and turning off your heating and all of those things than anything else that you can do. And so, you know, what I would be saying to all of you is look into where your pensions are. Because again, we have reached the point on the pensions where ethical and sustainable pensions are becoming as rewarding as the other ones used to be. It used to be there was a charge, as it were, there weren't enough products out there. Um, but there's been some extraordinary surveys on this. Basically, DFID in the UK asked a huge spread of British people what they thought about their pensions and would they expect it to be, as it were, benignly invested. And 70% said they thought it should be and they thought it was. And of course, it's not. Absolutely. And one of my big inspirations, and this is a woman who's actually here in Davos called Bronwyn King, this brilliant oncologist, spent her whole life as a cancer doctor, saving people's lives one by one, and then had her first meeting with her accountant. And at the end of the meeting, she said, where's my pension invested? And he said, oh, it's in a you know, lovely default pension. And she said, what does that mean? She, he said, well, you have the full range of things that you can invest in. And she said, well, come back next week and tell me where it is. And four out of the top five were cigarette companies. So she'd actually killed more people by her investment than saved lives. So I would, this is just as it were, you've always got to be general and specific. So I just want to show you this little film, the first one, which I hope represents what some of the people who work for and with you might think about pensions in their daily lives. That's the dream, yeah. Tell me about it. <laughs> that sounds amazing, doesn't it? That sounds quite a fairy tale. I would wonder why I hadn't been told about it already. It doesn't sound like it can or, or should work. You mean my pension hot before I've even touched it? I had absolutely no idea that my pension was being invested at all. I didn't really read the small print or understand. It's actually never occurred to me before that my pension could be something 
that would create change. I'd probably be surprised about my pension being something making a difference because I think most people don't know what their pension's investing in. Well, I would want a very like specific breakdown of where my money is going to, like how it's been invested. It would be good to know more about the companies that my pension is being invested in, whether they're doing good in the world. Who are they? Who are they run by? What are they doing? Where are they? What? Invest in these. You're reading this like a list of horror. Uh. Everything about it is vile. Making weapons and ammunition, it's a no-go. There's none that I would feel comfortable. None of these things I want my potential kids to to grow into a world for cigarette companies, coal mines, oil companies, gambling. <laughs> no way. No. You can have your list back. <laughs> I feel like something better could be done, done with my money. Oh, well, there you go. That is a stunning list of good things. Yeah, if my pension went to these things, that would be a wonderful, wonderful thing. So on this list, these are all projects and ideas that I would definitely back, I would definitely support social housing, infrastructure like schools and hospital. I would definitely want my money to be invested in building wind farms and tackling climate change. And companies that treat their work as well, this is my kind of list. And I, as a kind of customer, can feel, first of all, better about where my money is going, but also you would assume that those pensions would do actually quite well, probably make more money, ultimately. My money going into this, will I get a return? That's the first thing I'd think of. There are many different definitions of it. From my perspective, I think responsible investing is the way in which investors engage with the companies they invest in to ensure that they behave in a sustainable way. And yes, that is likely to deliver better returns over long periods of time. Responsible investing is investing in companies which look after their workforce, look after the environment, and have a kind of long-term sustainable view about the world and their company. Everyone benefits. Uh, the investors benefit, companies benefit, their employees benefit, and society benefits. It would make me feel, feel better in some, some small way that the things that I believe in, the things that I'm, I think are important and they're important to me are being reflected in how my money is being used. If I knew that my pension contribution was going towards investing in these things, I would probably go so far as to say I would increase my pension contributions. What I can do now is go away and do my own research and just understand better where my money goes. Yeah, I'm going to go make some calls and I'll leave here. Now I'm going to run back home and check what exactly has been done with it. I've always thought that the money in my pension was just sort of sitting there, you know, that it didn't really do much. So um, understanding that the money could be working and obviously working to contribute to a better world. Like, that's pretty amazing. Well, there we go. It suddenly occurs to me you're quite a curious audience to show it to because, of course, I'd like these ethical pensions to be investing in your businesses and say, well, these are exactly the things that everybody would, as it were, like to be giving their money to. So that's just an example of one of the things. And um, so that's my basic, you know, pitch and thought, which is as you run a business, how much are you thinking about the ethical side? How much are you think about the sustainable side? Do you think it would be interesting to look at the goals, understand them? I've, I mean, I've seen some the GSMA now have a 180-page book which goes through all the 163 targets and actually puts their business practices in every single target next to every single one of those. I don't suggest that you do that because that seems to me like a year's worth of work and um, when you could be making money in products. Um, but uh, I mean, I would love now because we've got 15 or 20 minutes just to have a chat about the extent to which this is one of the things that you as young presidents think about what stumbling box you hit it'd be great for me to hear it you know whether there are things that you're enthusiastic about or have done in some areas that have made a difference either to help you make more money or to help your staff and all those kind of things so i'd very much like to open it up here
then there's also the question of greenwashing because it's the fashion for you to change something and have a nice story but it might not really resolve an issue in the world so what is your take on your experience on that looking from a you know storytelling side and then what yeah. do you need to do? well I mean on the on the first one um, you know the sustainable investment will invest in the companies that are going to make the most difference to the sustainable development goals so I see a sort of direct link there the sustainable development goals have huge issues of justice and huge issues of law huge issues of innovation and education all of that stuff um, but I think sustainable investment is one of the ways to fuel it because when in 2005 we were thinking about it literally everybody said well this is just all whether or not the UK gives 0.7 of its budget in order to help you know, poorer countries pay for better education systems or anything like that. Um, as far as the, you know, the greenwashing issue and all of that is concerned, I feel that a toe in the water... In I mean, my theory on giving has normally been every comedian who I work with on Red Nose Day, they'd all given a few quid when they were young and done something for Red Nose Day and then suddenly they get the opportunity to do more and they do more and they help us make millions. So I'm sure there will be many companies, I mean I cannot believe that almost all fossil fuel companies now only advertise how much they're doing. Every single ad you say, say we're the best people on wind. It's as though they didn't even extract oil from the ground any longer. <laughs> They're so obsessed by all that. So I think there is that. But I do think engagement is the issue and is the way. And we've set up a group called the Business Avengers. We've got a dinner tonight. We've got Microsoft and... Nike and Salesforce and people like that. And you see the way that they're moving. You know, Microsoft announced that it would go, as it were, carbon negative the other day. And you do see the way that getting engaged, even if you start with something that's a bit more like greenwashing, once you start telling your employees and your consumers that we are a good company and that we do care about that, then they will hold you to that new standard, you know, and they will have higher expectations of how that's going to work. And there's a brilliant platform that Salesforce have developed, which is a sort of philanthropic platform for every company. And I would suggest that you all get that. And what it is, is a place where every person who works for the company goes on there, says what charitable things they're doing, sees what things the company is doing in the local community, but then also sees how the company at its biggest stretch is doing with regard to things like gender equality and with regard to, you know, sustainable investment and all those sort of things. So the moment you start to set yourself a standard, you set yourself, I mean, unless you're the Catholic Church, uh, you set yourself, you set yourself at even, like to tease Morris, um, you set yourself at even higher standards. So I believe that, you know, there have to be radical changes. But then I also think that it is pushing people to invest in more interesting R&D you know, which is a really interesting point. So biofuels, because of pressure, you know, p companies that say we've got a green flight in comparison to a not green flight, that's pretty marginal in the number of seats on the plane. But wait till biofuels are developed to the point where planes are not so carbon damaging. Those companies will have the most massive advantage and they would be investing as much as they can in that. So, But I tend to be an optimist and I'm not an angry person. But I feel as though all of us should work with the good things that we've got and then try and push those. So there's one area that I'm talking about where you think we're really good on gender equality. We'll be the hero company, you know, on that and all that sort of thing. So it doesn't, it worries me because it will slow things down and it will allow people to criticize the movement, but it also, I think, uh, they are the green shoots. If I could take just one question, is that with this fantastic campaign, I was very excited when I first heard you saying this, is there a danger of having the problem before the solution? So we got members in 130 countries, and let's say, some of our, I think, 29,000 members start saying, no, this is great, let's see about... It and it has, actually. I think because we're still using the old data. We're moving fast. What happens if people start saying, hey, we want to invest our pensions and in impact investment, but in a lot of places they haven't yet got the infrastructure to do so? So what, what happens then? Have you thought through the setting up, sort of talking to the people who are doing the provision at the same time as convincing those of us that this is where we need to be moving our pension funds? Um, 
Yeah, I mean, it, that was one of the very first things. That, I mean, the two things that people said were difficult is, one, it can be complicated moving your pension, and that's one of the reasons why I would be coming to you, because actually you will all have financial advisors who would find that conversation easier, as it were, than I as an individual would. But um, it that seems to be, a, I would just say, a secondary problem, because as this grows... So I was with some people called Bridges Management. I went to them two years ago, said, what can you do? They said, well, we haven't really got the products. Suddenly I go back to them, they've got the products. So I do think that people are finding very good things. And I think what's interesting is also thinking about the definition of, of what it is. I think when people started thinking about ethical investment, I certainly thought it was all coffee, plantation, grow small farmers in Kenya producing a new kind of coffee or chocolate. Now, when I go and visit Bridges Management, they're all full of affordable care for older people, of people supplying better quality local food into schools, of the people who actually put the oil into the into the mills that I mean into the, you know, land uh, the wind, the wind farms, and everything like that. So, as it's really encouraging new businesses in that area. So, I, I think at the moment we we would that we were in a position where there weren't enough things to invest in. There may be some countries where there aren't, but as it were, universally, I think there are a huge number of interesting companies that are doing interesting things that could do with more investment and will therefore thrive by being ethical. Yeah. Are actually are the pensions that are um, administering the funds and then now they're going out and we're giving them um, just opportunities to speak and just different formats for them to go to their investment managers so that it can open up a whole other host of opportunities so if people could start approaching in that arena a lot of money that's untapped I mean I do think that's fair I mean, we, and we have by the way looked into it and found that that whole issue of investment managers being fundamentally conservative and having been brought up in the other system so we are trying to do this in a non adversarial way but actually so we're looking in a way at three levels the pension companies themselves and talking about how they can be successful I believe there's a new company in Australia called My Future Super who have been part of the campaign that the uh, cancer doctor that I was talking about has launched there and they are the most successful new pension company in Australia because there's no young people. There's no, they're the only company that a young person starting out has heard of. And they think, well, I'm definitely going to go for that one. Um, so I do think you're right. And then there are sort of fiduciary duties in terms of responsibilities and they also have to be dealt with. So, I mean, I'd be very interested. I'd love to, since you're in that business, to talk to you. But we're very aware that it's both legal, business, personal passion. But when we started, and this is about you saying there aren't enough things, everybody, lawmakers, pension owners said we need some kind of public demand. And of course, the most important public demand would be if 29,000 small businesses said, we want our pensions to be in these things, then they would definitely sit up and listen and change swifter. Just one last comment. This is such a, a time as this because so many countries now, especially in Canada, which I know the market well, are setting in place that when a pension does their books at the end of the year, they have to declare how they're managing it. If they're using SDGs, if they're about what their fiduciaries are doing, and if they're not doing it, why they're not doing it. But I think a lot of other countries I think it is exciting. And there's something in France, isn't there, where 10% of your pension has to go by law into ethical and sustainable investment. So these are interesting movements. And that's also what's so interesting about you being in so many countries because, you know, different governments may take a government that's really committed to the SDGs may say, well, this is an area where we can do a great big thing and instigate something like the French thing where actually the law rather than favoring 
non-ethical investment may suddenly put an enormous gift its way. Sammy, we only have time for one last question because... Oh, yes. I thought that was a question, but that was you saying you have to go. Well, no, it's, it's actually been for a huge number of countries and also for the UK. Because I was wondering, maybe fundraising possibility that you've been able to create a track record of at least worse, why wouldn't you raise more for other countries specifically? Because as you say, there's billions lying in the pension fund. So oh, I, I, you have that magnetism of being able to raise the funds and then deploy it in other countries with the right partners and incentives. We're definitely trying to do that. And Red Nose Day, which went to America, is now, I hope, going to go global. And you're seeing some amazing international fundraising things, Movember and Giving Tuesday. And I think the internet's going to transform um, giving. And I would also say, all of you guys, can you just put in your diary on the 26th of September, are uh, these global citizen concerts, which are happening in nine different venues, are going to be all about the goals. They've got 36 of the world's biggest pop stars uh, already doing it. But if there was any day, that's why that ended with September the 25th, if there was any day that you wanted to say to the people you work with, let's make that the aim when this company is going to announce three exciting things that we're doing and a kind of shift in direction so as to prepare ourselves to be at the forefront of the goals and at the forefront of ethical business, uh, making more money than ever, that'd be great. And I'm going to try and bother... Um, Morris and I'm, I don't know how often you get together and how often you mail each other, but it would be great to feel we can stay in touch and really make this one of the textures of the YPOs. Thank you so much, Richard. That was brilliant. What an amazing pre-start to our week in Davos because what do we're... They call, it? they call it a moose bush. That's exactly <laughs> right. <laughs> moose bush before even the starter. It's absolutely yeah. brilliant. And, you know, to, to place it with somebody whose heart... And I, he's so modest. I mean, you, I, to tell you, you ask him anything around any subject. We've had this terribly divisive time in our pol politics in the UK. And I, I reached out to Richard. I said, can we do something to reunite, you know, stop this division and... You know, First person, he's, if you need to ask something to be done, you have to ask a busy person, somebody who gives. And this is a man who gives from his heart and has done the most phenomenal things. And I think it's an inspiration to all of us as we come here to Davos to plug in to the kind of amazing agendas that are out there that people are already doing and say, what can we do to step up to make a real difference in this world? So thank you so much, Richard. Well,